So uh, this time I'm going to talk about attention. Um, I'm going to talk about um, attention, very brief overview of the things that you've already seen in the reading. And then after that, I'm going to go into um, some more advanced topics that weren't included in the reading, uh, culminating with uh, talking about the transformer model, um, which is very popular. Uh, now you can load it in like nn.transformer. Uh, uh, so like you don't even like necessarily need to look under the hood to, understand, to um, use it. But I think understanding it is very important in order to use it effectively uh, in downstream tasks and also to understand maybe when you shouldn't be using it because uh, it's not the answer to all of your problems. So, um, so that's uh, kind of the agenda for today. Um, in last time we talked about uh, regular encoder-decoder models without attention, where you basically take an encoder, uh, calculate a single vector, um, and, uh, and then you calculate an output. Um, so we have our encoder and our decoder. Um, and when you think about ways to represent sentences, um, there's a famous quote by Ray Mooney, uh, which was, uh, he's an um, NLP researcher, and he gave a talk at the first workshop on representation learning for uh, natural language processing or semantic, uh, semantics for natural language processing or something. Um, and uh, he, he said, you, can, you can't cram the meaning of a whole bleeping sentence into a single bleeping vector. Um, and I, I, I kind of like this quote. Um, the reason why he was saying it then was because then predominantly people were using regular encoder-decoder models without attention. And they were trying to take you know, sentences of all links and um, uh, you know, turn them into a single vector. Um, but basically what we're doing in attention is we're, we're saying, hey, Ray Mooney was right. It's really hard to cram the meaning or like all of the useful information in a whole sentence into a single vector. So instead, we'd like to use multiple vectors um, and you know, kind of process them dynamically. So um, attention is a way to do that. So the basic idea is we encode each word in the sentence into a vector. And uh, when decoding or making predictions, uh, we perform a linear combination of the vectors uh, weighted by attention weights. Um, and you know, specifically, if we're doing encoder decode, uh, decoder models, uh, we use this combination of picking the next word. So um, for example, if we have a context of I hate um, that we've, we have so far, and now we want to generate the next word, we will um, use a query vector. Uh, where this is the query vector here, and this is essentially the last decoder state that we have. And then we have key vectors, and these key vectors are uh, you know, n vectors uh, that we would then like to be calculating attention over. And for each uh, query key pair, we calculate a weight or a score, attention score, which we'll call A. Um, these can be any arbitrary score. And then we normalize these scores to add to one uh, by running them through a softmax. And then we get something like alpha, which is a weighted, weighted sum like this. So this was in the reading. I, I don't think um, you know, uh, it should be new. Are there any questions? OK, yeah. Why use a softmax and not say normalize by dividing by the L2 norm or something? So why, why is it a softmax and not, say, normalizing by dividing by the L2 norm or something like that? So that's a very good question. Um, people have tried other things, like um, a sigmoid function, for example, which uh, a sigmoid function, what that would do instead is it would take all of these values and normalize them between 0 and 1. So then you could focus on multiple um, inputs. And I think, long story short, like the softmax actually is pretty effective, um, even compared to other alternatives. And, I think it's quite possible that when they wrote the original attention paper on this, they actually tried multiple things and settled on this. And empirically, I found um, that this works as well. It's especially good for machine translation um, because in machine translation, it gives you a strong inductive bias that there's one word translating into another word. Um, but if you're doing other tasks, I think it would be perfectly reasonable to try other things, uh, other ways of normalizing. Or not normalize at all, but uh, normal normalizing seems like it would be a good idea. Good question. Any others? No, it's actually a problem with his. What do you mean by inductive bias in case of... Oh, so what do I mean by inductive bias? So inductive bias, like uh, I think Pungfei talked about before, is basically some way of structuring your model so it learns the thing that you want to learn. So like what I said at the very beginning of the class is neural networks are universal function approximators. And any neural network in theory can learn, well, 
you know, it, as long as the input size and the output size are correct, are correct, and the function is smooth, um, neural networks can learn any function you want. So you could even, let's say you wanted to do machine translation from English into Spanish, um, you could just stack all of the input vectors together um, and say like your maximum sentence length was 100, so you stack up all the word vectors together, you pad it up to 100, you feed it through a huge MLP and predict up to 100 words on the output side, and you could theoretically do translation with that model. It's just a really bad model, um, and it would need a huge amount of data to learn it effectively, essentially. So an inductive bias is basically a way to structure your model in a way um, that allows it to learn more effectively with less data. Like an Alice Tim, that's a choice that, or some kind of rec rec recurrent model would be a choice that, okay. Yeah, so a recurrent model is a choice. Another example that Pengfei talked about was a CNN has an inductive bias for looking at local engrams because you think local engrams are going to be more informative than, for example, grabbing three random words in the sentence or like shuffling the words in the sentence and then doing a CNN over that. That seems like a bad model, right? Because right. there's locality in language. So. Um, and with respect to inductive bias imposed by the softmax here, the reason why I'm saying that there's an inductive bias for machine translation, for example, is because the softmax essentially picks a single word. It's soft, but it's essentially picking a single word that you want to focus on, um, or you know, a mixture of a very small number of words. And the idea is that you know, when you trans, when you try to generate a word, you're probably only going to have to look at you know one or a few words. Yeah. Okay. Um, Good questions. Um, any other questions as we move on? OK. Um, so then uh, we combine together uh, something we call value vectors. Um, and these are usually encoder states, like key vectors, by taking a weighted sum together uh, based on these attention weights. And this gives us the context vector. And we can use this in any part of the model that we like. So um, I, I don't. It, the original paper on attention doesn't make this distinction between query vectors, key vectors, and value vectors. But I think it's a really nice distinction to make because basically um, the key vectors and the value vectors can be the same. They can both be uh, you know, the, um, the hidden states in the encoder or something like that. But you can also make them different if you want, uh, where you look up what content to read uh, using the key vectors, but then the actual content is uh, is in the value vectors. So um, this gives you a little bit more modeling flexibility if you wish. So here's a graphical example. Um, and the way this works is black indicates a lower um, attention value. Uh, white indicates a higher attention value. And here, um, I believe French, French is the output? Yes. Yeah, French is the output. So. Um, basically, you are um, in each row. This normalizes to uh, to one, and the lighter colors are the ones that have a higher attention weight. And you can see, kind of, if you know French, um, or even if you don't know French, you can kind of guess maybe um, that these uh, are kind of aligned to each other. And then when you get, uh, uh, I won't even pr try to pronounce uh, French, but uh, uh, like La Zone uh, Economic European. Um, you can see a uh, European economic area is reversed in English, but it, it's actually picking up this reversal just through end-to-end -end training. Okay. Um, any questions so far? Um, so attention uh, score functions. Um, so the important thing is uh, we had a, um, a way of calculating an attention score here. So I left this as a gear just to kind of underspecify it and show that you can use different uh, values. Um, but what do we put in this gear? And the answer is um, uh, there's lots of different ways we can do this. Uh, the original paper did this with multi-layer perceptron. And uh, the way this looks is by basically um, uh, your score function is equal to um, concatenating the query and the key vectors, um, multiplying this by a weight, running it through a nonlinearity, and then multiplying it by another vector to get the, um, get the output. So this is basically like a classifier or a regressor to the, um, to the score. Um, so what are the advantages of this? This is flexible. 
as a you know a one layer MLP is a universal function approximator. I'm going to say universal function approximator a lot. Um, uh, so this could do any attention function that you wanted uh, whatsoever. So uh, that's the advantage of this. Um, however, uh, it's a little bit indirect. So like let's say um, we had an intuition that the query vectors and the key vectors are kind of in a, the same space or a similar space or something like this. It's actually relatively difficult for an MLP to learn how to compare two vectors um, and say these two vectors are more similar, these two vectors are less similar. Um, an easier way to do that, actually, let me skip. An easier way to do that is the dot product between two vectors. So we know the dot product between two vectors, the more similar these vectors are, uh, the higher score you're going to get. Um, so you take the query vector um, in the key vector, you take the dot product of the two, and you now have, um, you now have a score. Um, so this is a non-parametric model, um, it, uh, but it requires the size of the query and key vectors to be the same. Um, so another thing you can do is this bilinear function. And what the bilinear function does is it basically multiplies the key vector, um, does a linear transform on it, and then, uh, then multiplies this with the query vector. So this relaxes two things. Number one, it relaxes the requirement that the sizes can be the same because this matrix W doesn't have to be a square matrix. It could be a rectangular matrix that changes the sizes. It also relaxes the assumption that they're in the same space because you can do a linear transform and convert it to a, a different space. So it's kind of in between the multilayer perceptron, which is an arbitrarily complex function, and the dot product, which is completely constrained. So it allows uh, like flexibility in the middle. Um, then there's the scaled dot product, um, and what the scaled dot product uh, does is basically um, the scaled dot product has a problem, or the regular dot product has a problem that the scale of the dot product increases as the dimensions get larger. So, like, let's say you had um, a 512 dimensional vector and a 1024 dimensional vector. The dot product of the 1024 dimensional vector, if you're just taking random vectors, will on average have a scale twice as large uh, because you're multiplying two vectors. And if the vectors are longer, the scale will be larger. Um, so uh, basically what this does is this uh, fixes by the, uh, the scale by the size of the vector, um, like this. And it, specifically, you take the square root of the size of the uh, um, the square root of the size of the uh, key vector. So um, I have two quiz questions with respect to this. Um, why only the key vector? This is the easy quiz question. Yeah. Yeah, because the size is the same of the key vector and the query vector. So it doesn't matter. We could take the query vector or the key vector. It doesn't matter. OK, harder quiz question. Why the square root? Any takers? Yeah. Uh, empirically, empirically, this performed better. Uh, probably yes, <laughs> but <laughs> there is actually a motivation behind it as well. Is it kind of like the Euclidean norm or something? Is it kind of like the Euclidean norm? Um, I mean, not necessarily. Uh, not really. That's a good. That's a good intuition. But then I think it would rather be around the um, around this value yeah. here as opposed to that. Um, yeah. Uh, so from a physical interpretation, the, uh, this, the, if you think about physical distribution, that diffusion along time or along the length of vector is actually proportional to square root of time. Okay. Right. So I, I heard variance and I heard diffusion. In both both of these, yes, basically it, it's correct. So if you plot the distribution, um, you plot the distribution of the outputs that you get, um, the variance of the distribution will be approximately equal to the, uh, to the square root. So um, especially if you're, you assume that each of, the, um, each of the values here is random, uh, the variance will be equal to the, the square root. Um, so uh, variance, standard deviation, something, something like that. But that's the general intuition behind this. Um, if you want to calculate this uh, and, uh, and figure it out, you, uh, you can, yeah. So why would that help? 
So why would that why would that help? Basically, it normalizes the variance to be constant regardless of the size of the um, regardless of the size of the vectors. So it makes um, it makes the variance not dependent on the, the size of the vectors here. Yeah. Uh, one second. Uh, does that mean that Q and K do not have to be normalized vectors itself? So Q and K, um, these will be normalized later when you put them into the softmax. But basically, this controls the peakiness of the softmax and makes sure that you don't have really peaky distributions for your attention right at the beginning of training, for example. So, um, OK. So um, I have an example of um, attention here. So I, um, I got some feedback, uh, which I think is good feedback, that uh, sometimes people would like a little bit more direction on um, like how to take the ideas in class and put them into practice. So um, it's a little bit late now, but um, if you want to take a look at the, uh, the code examples, I will give you some things that you could specifically look at in the code example. So we have a code example, batch detention.py, um, in the code examples directory. And if you wanted to take a look at this, this code uses MLP attention. Um, so what would you do to implement a different variety of attention? So you could go in and take a look um, at this code and say, oh, this is what I would need to do to change it. And if you actually want to run it, you can go in and run it and change it. So um, we don't have a lot of assignments in this class. Uh, because um, you know each assignment we have is relatively you know strenuous or takes time, um, but like this would be something you can do if you want to follow uh, follow along. Um, okay. So uh, next. So uh, up until this was a little bit of uh, a little bit of review from the reading. Um, next, I want to talk about um, uh, like various things that you can uh, do attention over. Um, so the first thing is, um, I've already talked about doing attention over the input sentence. Um, and uh, so that's kind of like the, the basic thing that you do in sequence sequence models. But there's also other ways you can use the attention value set you calculate. And one example of them is the copy mechanism. So the copy mechanism, basically the idea here is we have a, um, we have a, an input sentence like, uh, hello, my name is Tony Jabara. Jabara. Um, and you want to do summarization or you know something like that. Um, but we have Jabara, which is a out of vocabulary word or a rare word or something like this. Um, and if this is the case, then it's a kind of a tall order to assume that our model is going to be able to actually generate this word. Um, given you know just its training data, if, and if it's never seen Tony Jabara, um, if you're using a regular word-based model, it has no chance whatsoever of generating this word, right? So um, one way you can use attention uh, that is actually very widely used in a lot of different uh, applications is to have two ways of generating output. The first way of generating output is by just generating output from your vocabulary. The second way of generating, uh, generating output is by um, uh, generating output from, your, uh, from the source sentence itself. So basically what you do is you have a gate. So um, the gate is like some sort of, uh, some sort of sigmoid function. Um, and the total probability, or let me, let me write this as like G. So I'll call this the the gate for copying. And um, our total probability of any vocabulary item is uh, copy um, uh, source. And then um, the vocab. So the um, so 
this is just your normal um, this is just your normal probability uh, over the outputs. So you calculate this according to your normal softmax. This probability here for the source is basically um, the probability of generating any uh, any word in the source. So if you're attending um, according to the current attention values. So if your attention is 20% uh, on hello and 75% uh, on uh, Jabara, basically the probability of hello according to this probability would be 0 0.2 and the probability of Jabara would be 0 0.75. So um, let's say you had a really high uh, copy gate uh, probability. So let's say this was like 99%. Then the probability of outputting Jabara despite the fact that it's not in the vocabulary of your normal softmax would be very high and you could just output directly from the source. So this is really, really useful. It's kind of useful in something like machine translation. It's really useful in things like summarization or dialogue response generation or um, other things like this where it's very common to copy words directly from the input to the output. Um, also uh, data to text generation. Uh, so like if you have a um, like I talked about before, you have a box score from a basketball game um, and you want to generate an article about the basketball players. You want to make sure that you're um, copying the names of the basketball players instead of hallucinating like Michael Jordan instead of, uh, you know, LeBron James or something like that. So, um, uh, so yeah, this is a really useful thing to know. Um, so... Another way you can do this is by um, using a translation dictionary. So this is a, um, this is a generalization of um, uh, the copy mechanism. Uh, th this is some work that one of my students did in 2016, but I, th I think it's useful. It's a generalization of the copy mechanism that basically says for each position, we are going to calculate the probability of outputting a particular word according to a dictionary. Um, and so, for example, uh, the word I, there is a couple, let's say we're translating into Japanese. There's a couple ways to say the word I in Japanese. Um, watashi is the most common one, so it's like 60%. Uh, ore is less common, so it's 0.2% or something like this. And um, then uh, come, there's a couple ways to say come. Uh, there's a uh, couple ways to say from, and uh, Tunisia, so this is a rare word, um, and the reason why we were motivated to come up with something like this is uh, precisely because regular attention-based sequence, sequence models are really bad at rare words, um, and they do things like, um, say, translate uh, Tunisia, Tunisia into Holland, um, so I come from Tunisia becomes I come from Holland. Uh, <laughs> This actually appeared in our, uh, in our outputs. And you, if you try somewhat hard, you can get the same thing to happen with Google Translate as well. Um, but, uh, uh, but anyway, so like, because of this rare words, it's often hard to train a, a good translation model to do those properly. But it's actually relatively easy to get a dictionary, right? You know, you just download the language links in Wikipedia, and now you have a dictionary between named entities or something like this. So um, you prepare a matrix that looks like this, where each uh, column uh, corresponds to a source word, each row corresponds to a target word. Then you take the weighted sum of this matrix according to your attention values. And um, let's say most of your attention is, attention is on Tunisia, um, but uh, so then you get a very high probability for Tunisia according to this. So I said this is a generalization of the copy mechanism. And the reason why this is a generalization of a copy mechanism is you can view the copy mechanism is basically something where this is a one hot vector where the value is one if these two are identical and the value is zero if these two are not identical. So um, this gives you more, more flexibility than the copy mechanism uh, essentially. So uh, th I think this is a good uh, you know, method to know about and you can take a look at the paper if you're interested. Um, okay, any questions? Okay. Um, another thing you can attend to is uh, previously generated things. So, um, for example, in language modeling, uh, you attend to, uh, you can attend to the previous words. So, um, language models, uh, 
you know, very often will, it's a little bit less common nowadays, but you could have a closed vocabulary. Um, and if you have a closed vocabulary, it's impo again, impossible to generate something like Yellen, or when you generate it, you need to generate it from a subword model that doesn't give you very good, um, you know, doesn't give you very good predictive power. Um, but language is bursty. So um, once you say something once, you're very likely to say it again. Um, so for example, if you say Janet Yellen once in a news article, you're very likely to talk about it again, right? Um, so what this model does is it basically attends to the things you've already generated. Um, and uh, it has a gating mechanism similar to the gating mechanism here. The only difference being that your date is the built-in vocab and all the things you've generated before, right? Um, so this is, uh, this is a very nice uh, method to have. Um, this is also um, done in self-attentional models to translation, like the transformer, which I'm going to be talking about uh, soon. Um, one thing you should know about models like this is these models look like they give you really large gains in perplexity um, when trained in a maximum likelihood estimation uh, framework. Um, but they might actually not help you a whole lot when you use them in downstream tasks. And the reason why is because they give you a lot of power to look back at the things you've already generated. But what if the things you already generated are wrong, right? So like, let's say you had a machine translation model that needed to generate Janet Yellen, um, but it actually generated like Janet Yelp or something like that. So then you would be generating you would be looking back to your previously generated context and you would be generating Janet Yelp, Janet Yelp, Janet Yelp uh, over and over again. Um, so this is uh, a problem of exposure bias, uh, which I'll be talking about uh, in the future, where exposure bias is basically like, if you've never seen mistakes during training, um, you might be very prone to uh, generating, like causing more mistakes in the future. And this is a model that's particularly susceptible to this type of bias because it can look very directly back at the uh, things it's previously generated. Yes? What, what is the pointer and what is the problem that we're looking at? So the pointer, uh, the pointer, you can view it as like the copy mechanism, essentially. It's, point, it's pointing back. Oh, so copy, copy mechanisms and pointer networks are two different names for basically the same thing. So a pointer network and a copy mechanism are both things that um, do attention um, over an input and, uh, and generate an output. And the reason why they're called two different things is because two different papers came out at almost exactly the same time uh, doing almost exactly the same thing. And they're both kind of like famous papers. So uh, yeah. But if you hear copy mechanism and pointer network, they're the same. Um, that's a good question. Any other questions? Okay. Um, oh, and Sentinel is the same as gating, uh, basically. The, the senti it, it's a slightly different way. Like, basically, the idea is when you attend to the Sentinel, uh, that becomes your gating probability here. Um, but it's, uh, it's a similar, uh, similar thing. Okay. Um, another thing you can attend to is various modalities. So, like, I, um, I don't want to go into this a lot because this is not a, um, a multimodal class. Um, but, of course, you can attend to images or you can attend to uh, speech. Um, the attention mechanism, basically, it started out in the image domain uh, and, uh, uh, and was imported very quickly to uh, NLP. But um, there's also methods uh, to do this that are very useful. Another thing is uh, hierarchical attention. And hierarchical attention is basically um, a way to attend to documents or other kind of long, um, long pieces of uh, text or whatever else. And the idea is simply that you have a lower level attention mechanism that does attention, for example, over words. And then you have a higher level attention mechanism that does attention over sentences. So for each sentence, you do attention over each of the words. You summarize that into a, a vector for the sentence, and then um, you do attention over the sentences. And this is proven useful for things like document classification, et cetera.
Um, another thing that you can do that can be very, very useful uh, for many applications is attending to multiple sources. Um, so one example of this is um, in translation where you attend to multiple input sentences. So you have um, a translation in, uh, sorry, you have a sentence in German and you have a sentence in French and then you attend to both of them at the same time to, uh, to generate an English sentence. Um, and uh, there's different strategies to do so. So one way you can do this is by just concatenating the two together. Another way you can do this is by doing something like the hierarchical attention that I just talked about and attending to each sentence separately, then combining their vectors together. Um, this doesn't seem like it would be super useful at first for something like translation, perhaps, because like, you know, normally when we think about translation, we think about the Google Translate text box and we put in our English and we want Chinese, right? Or something like that. Or we put in our Chinese and want English. Um, uh, but when would we have two sentences that say the same thing? Um, but the answer is actually this is really common. Um, so like for example, TED Talks, uh, subtitles for TED Talks are translated into 40 languages, um, but there's, uh, you know, 300 languages that they're not yet translated into. So you could attend to, you know, multiple things, multiple inputs and generate a new one where maybe one is the original English because the TED talk was originally in English and the, another one was, um, you know, the language that's most close to the language you want to translate into. So um, there's lots of other examples of attending to multiple sources. Um, to give just one other example, um, multimodal translation. So we assume that uh, we have a robot like uh, C3PO or something like that um, that is situated in a scene, so it can use its eyes to look at the output, uh, to look at the surroundings, and it's also listening to a stream of speech that it would like to translate. And it gets an ambiguous sentence like, um, could you go over to the bank over there? Um, and you don't know if it's river bank or financial bank, but if you can look and see that a river bank exists, uh, then you, um, uh, you know, then uh, you can disambiguate. So. Um, lots and lots of examples where something useful, uh, something like this could be useful. They basically consist of one of two strategies, which is concatenating the inputs together or doing some sort of hierarchical attention. So um, if you're interested, you can take a look at the references. Okay. Um, so another example is um, intra-attention or self-attention. So now most of the time it's called self-attention. Um, I think the original paper called it intra-attention, is um, basically what you do is each element in the sentence attends to other elements to create uh, context-sensitive encodings. And um, the reason why this makes sense is you can even see, um, okay, maybe this is not the best, maybe this is not the best example, but um, uh, like, Maybe a better example would be, um, I, s I saw him withdraw money. Um, I need to withdraw money, so I'm planning on going to the bank tomorrow. So um, again, this is an example where you would need to disambiguate bank for translation. So one really easy way to disambiguate bank is to mix a little bit of money into it, right? So you take, um, you take the bank representation and you, uh, in a self-attention or intra-attention layer, you uh, take its representation of bank, um, you multiply this by 0 0.8, um, and then you also attend to the representation of money, and now it's pretty unquestionably a financial bank, right? Because it's also like moved a little bit in the direction of, uh, of money. Yeah. Um, but, uh, wouldn't ideally the normal bidirectional RNN do the same thing? Uh, yes, um, but this is more direct. And in general, in neural networks, like I've talked about vanishing gradients and stuff like this, when you have a more direct connection to do the thing that you want, it's a better inductive bias. It, you know, it's easier to learn because you don't need to go through lots of steps and, uh, and guess. Uh, yeah. But then the same logic would be used in RNN because 
end of the day, in our dynamics, I get to do the same thing, like capturing multiple sentences, like multiple words mm -hmm. and trying to get and no infringement of words. That my like, point is just to do the same self-reflection technique to like not use an RNA. Essentially we're doing the same thing. Yeah, so um, actually if you use self-attention very often you don't need to use an RNN. Um, uh, they have different inductive biases um, and different computational complexities. So I think essentially um, a self-attentional model will be very good at this disambiguation because it's so direct, right? In a single step, you just mix in a little bit of money into the bank and you get a financial bank. Um, on the other hand, self-attention models um, let, let me try to think of something they'd be bad at. They'd be bad at counting the number of words in a sentence, for example. Um, and the reason why is in LSTM, it's super simple to count the number of words in the sentence. You just do it by um, having a gate that's on every single time. And I showed an example of this in the previous class, right? Um, a self-attention model, there's no straightforward way to do it. Of course, you can. Um, there's actually an interesting paper at, uh, at iClear this year um, uh, saying our, uh, our transformers universal approximators of sequence to sequence functions. So basically they proved that um, a transformer can approximate any sequence to sequence function. So it's not that a transformer can't count numbers, it's just that it would be harder for it to do so um, because it doesn't have that inductive bias. So like, I think it's important to think like how directly like, let's say I hand-coded the weights of my network to try to do something. How hard would it be to hand-code the weights of the network to do something? And that's kind of a, a good um, approximation of, the, of whether that network has a good inductive bias to solve a problem or not. So, um, yeah. Does that answer the question? Yeah. Okay. Um, any other questions? Okay. I'll move on. Um, so, also... Um, I, I talked about what we can um, attend to. I'm going to talk to a couple improvements to attention. Um, so the first one is coverage. So um, we talked about this a little bit, uh, a little bit in the reading. So I'll, I'll go quickly. So um, basically, neural models tend to drop or repeat content, and um, the solution is model how many times words have been covered. Uh, there's a couple ways to do this. Um, one way is to directly impose a penalty on the model. Um, or on the decoding algorithm, uh, either or, um, uh, if the attention is not approximately one over each word. Um, so you can do this either at training time, uh, where like if the model learns to not put attention on certain words, it gets a penalty, and that's what they do in this cone et al. paper. Um, and the alternative is to do it at test time, where basically if you notice at test time that a word is not covered very much, you downweight uh, the hypothesis. And, um, uh, both of these have been uh, used in previous work. Um, another thing is adding embeddings indicating coverage. So you have some sort of embedding indicating how many times it's been covered. Um, personally, if I, wa I was going to implement this one, I would also implement this one too. Um, and the reason why is because if you just add an embedding, you know, you're not guaranteed that a maximum likelihood estimation is actually going to like, learn to use that embedding well. Um, but if you also added a, a penalty over attention, then that would, uh, that would give it a better uh, learning signal to use, utilize them appropriately. Um, another thing is incorporating uh, Markov properties. So the int intuition is that the attention from the last uh, time step tends to be correlated with the attention this time. So you can see this is really strong in French English. So um, you attend to the next one, next one, next one, jump a few forward jump backward, jump backward, jump a few forward, jump forward, stay the same, jump forward, jump forward, jump forward. Uh, sorry, uh, go forward one. So you can see that it's pretty consistently just moving, you know, like a little bit at a time. Um, so intuitively, you'd want to avoid, you know, lots of skipping around if you know a language doesn't have a lot of reordering or, you know, a task doesn't have a lot of reordering. Um, so uh, one way you can do this is add information about um, where the last attention occurred when you're making the decision about the next one. So this Cone et al. paper is a really nice paper. It, it just goes through a whole bunch of different things you can try uh, to bias attention appropriately. Uh, Bidirectional training. Um, so essentially, our, it says our attention should be roughly similar in the forward and backward uh, directions. 
Um, so you train so that you get a bonus based on the trace of the matrix product for training. Um, and intuitively, basically, this trace will be larger if the attention matrices look the same in both directions. Um, uh, I, I won't go into the, the details here, but uh, that's the basic idea. And this uh, allows you to uh, enforce that they look approximately symmetric. And we've used this in some of our work, and it does actually seem to work uh, pretty well, even in modern models. So um, this would be a good thing to think about. This also was actually one of the only uh, things that actually worked really well in the original paper here. So um, <laughs> that might be a good data point. Um, another thing you can do is uh, supervised training. So supervised training, basically, um, we can get gold standard alignments a priori. Um, these can be manually annotated alignments. Um, they can be, or they can be uh, pre-trained with a strong alignment model. So um, for example, if we have uh, a, a, another strong unsupervised alignment model that maybe is like way faster than our attentional trans, uh, translation model or something like that, um, we can use these alignments as a proxy for learning as well. And then we train the model to match these alignments. Um, we can just regularize towards, so the attention distribution matches the one induced by these alignments. Um, however, this is something that one of the students I was working with tried, and it didn't work for him. Um, it didn't work for him, but then three papers came out shortly after it saying it did work, so maybe we just didn't try hard enough. But part of the reason why I thought that maybe it didn't work for us is the second fact here, which is that attention is not the same as alignment. It's not necessarily the same as alignment. So um, attention is often blurred. So it can be blurred across multiple words. And um, one example of this would be this bank money situation, right? So in this case, it's actually a good idea to you know, attend a little bit to money because you know, money is what give, helps you disambiguate the, the meaning of the main word. Um, another thing, in, especially in not, well, not very well-trained models, um, attention can be off by one like this. So it's attending to the word next to the, uh, the current word as opposed to the actual word. Any idea why uh, this would happen or why the, this could even possibly be useful? Even if it's not aligning exactly with the current word, mm -hmm. but maybe for language modeling or for predicting the next word, it might be a bit more helpful. Yeah, so it, even though it might not align to the current word, for predicting the next word, it might be useful. Um, that might be the case. Uh, that's not exactly the answer that I was thinking about, though. So to give a hint, remember, what are we attending to? Are we attending to the word embeddings in the input? Hidden state. No, the hidden state. So, so why would we attend to the next one? Um, maybe the hidden state that is next after the word information because of, like, it has not only the other state, but also the next, so it has faster from the like, more knowledge about the, the previous reading stuff. Yeah, so, so maybe it's connected, maybe it's capturing more information. Um, I don't think it's necessarily capturing more information because we're running a bi-directional LSTM, but maybe it's easy enough for, like, the encoder, like a bi-directional LSTM, to just um, pass information one time step over, that it learns that, oh, I can just pass time, uh, you know, the information one time step over, and then the attention will focus on it anyway, so I don't need to worry about you know, uh, attending to the you know, correct uh, words. So, um, so basically, this one by off problem occurs pretty frequently. There's also an interesting paper or series of papers uh, recently that demonstrate that um, attention uh, like another reason why people use attention is because you can plot these things and like actually show, you know, maybe the model was focusing on this word when it made this prediction, which could be useful for interpretability or something like this. Um, but th what this paper shows is essentially you can manipulate attention in a way that you can create a completely different attention, um, uh, you know, uh, completely different attention vector and still have like a negligible effect on the actual predictions. Um, so uh, it, it demonstrates that, you know, essentially you can get, uh, you, your attention does not necessarily entail an explanation of the outputs. Um, 
And you know, we're going to talk about interpretation methods later. Um, and there are better interpretation methods that look more directly at what exactly the model is using to, uh, to make predictions. But this is just a, a good thing to mention. Um, any other questions? OK. So um, finally, I'm going to talk about a few specialized varieties of attention. So um, hard attention. Um, actually, in the original paper on attention, this uh, hard attention was uh, proposed. Um, and basically, instead of taking a soft interpolation, it makes a 0, 1 decision about where to attend to. Um, the problem with this is, so this is, becomes a discrete variable instead of a continuous variable. And the problem with this is um, it's harder to train, and it requires um, methods such as reinforcement learning to, uh, to apply it. Um, but uh, there are some, uh, some papers that demonstrate that this uh, might be a better choice for something like interpretability. Um, so basically, uh, you know, if you do hard attention and then just completely delete any influence from the other parts on your uh, outputs, then this might be a, a good way to, to create interpretable, uh, um, interpretable models. Um, so uh, this is very rarely used um, in actual systems just because soft attention seems to work just fine, but it is uh, something that you might uh, be able to, uh, it might be nice to know about. Another thing is monotonic attention. So basically, in some cases, we know the output will be the same order as the input. Um, some examples of this include speech recognition, um, incremental translation um, tasks, um, morphological inflection, so this is uh, where you basically take a word and you want to conjugate it. Um, very, there's very rarely reordering in this. Summarization, also there might not be very much reordering when you're doing summarization. Um, so there are methods that basically um, do this sort of monotonic attention where every time you attend, it has to attend to something after the stuff that you've already attended to, uh, the same or after uh, to the stuff you've already attended to. So. Um, if you're looking for a task like this, this might be an, another uh, concept to be aware of. Also, multi-head attention. So multi-head attention, the idea is that you have multiple heads that focus on different parts of the sentence. Um, so to give first a very <clears throat> intuitive uh, example of this, um, there is a paper that basically um, has copy mechanisms and regular uh, vocabulary generation mechanisms like I wrote here. But they use different attention heads for the copy mechanism and the, um, and the vocabulary generation uh, like probability distribution. And the reason why is because you know, the words you want to copy are very likely going to be different than the words that you want to use to actually generate a word from the vocabulary. So here, um, the pink one is the copy mechanism uh, head, and the yellow one is the vocabulary generation head. And um, you can see the copy mechanism head is much more monotonic. It's also much more sharp, basically. So it's learning to focus directly on the word that you want to be copying. Um, so this is generalized in, um, in the transformer model not generalized, sorry. This, uh, this is uh, also used in the transformer model that we're going to be talking about in a second. I um, mean, here, instead of having each head have actual semantics, you just uh, train eight heads individually, or 10, you know, 16 heads individually, or something like, uh, uh, like that. And you just, just you know, hope that they're going to learn different things. Um, the intuition behind this is still very similar, though, right? So. If we go back to the word sense disambiguation example, maybe uh, we want one head that selects the word we want to translate next. We want another head that selects all the contexts that may be useful in word sense disambiguation. Um, we might want another head that focuses on the next word, another head that focuses on the previous word, um, because those are going to be very informative. So um, uh, you can see here um, in this example, it's a little bit small, but basically, um, for calculating making, we have one head that focuses on the word itself, and then we also have uh, several heads that focus on like more and difficult 
And the reason why is make is something that we call in uh, linguistics a light verb. Um, and light verbs can be used in a bunch of different uh, like contexts, right? So make more difficult, um, make good time, make a cake, um, make it to uh, make it to class on time. Uh, so all of these probably, if you know another language and try to translate them, they're all going to be different translations, right? Um, so in order to disambiguate this make, um, it's pulling in the context. And you can see that certain heads are focusing on this context. Um, there's also a kind of crazy one that has one head for every hidden node. Um, uh, this is computationally intractable, so I don't, uh, I don't suggest that you do this, but hey, uh, if, you, if you want to go to the extreme, you can do this as well. Okay, so um, now that I've covered all the background, I'd like to go um, into this attention is all you need uh, paper, um, which introduces transformers. I think many, many people will be familiar with this. But the reason why I intentionally didn't introduce this first is because um, this is going to be a problem we're going to see in the next couple classes. We get a really nice name for something like transformer, but it actually is the agglomeration of a lot of different concepts. Um, and it's not the case that all of these have to come in one package necessarily. This happens to be a good package. It happens to work well. Um, but I. It's a good idea for people to uh, think uh, critically about these things. Um, so it, um, quoting uh, Chris Dyer, I'm stealing this quote because I love this, I love this quote. Um, uh, I don't have permission, but hopefully he'll forgive me. Um, but uh, like, it's not necessarily the case that it's att attention is all, the, all you need, but too often it's the case that attention is all you tried or <laughs> transformer is all you tried. So there's lots of, um, uh, there's lots of very, you know, reasonable manipulations that you could do here. So understanding the underlying components is a good way to put you on the, on the course to doing something like this. But anyway, that being said, um, this is a, a really nice model that does uh, in fact work well in a lot of situations. And it looks like this. Um, it, it's based entirely on attention. It doesn't have any LSTMs or anything like that. Um, and on the encoder side, you use self-attention to create the encodings. On the decoder side, you attend to all of the previous words uh, when you uh, decode the next words. So it's basically, like I said before, um, you know, you're attending both to the input sequence and the words that you previously generated. Um, it is using a number of blocks. Maybe I'll come back to this diagram uh, after I explain all the tricks, but basically um, it's using self-attention so it's attending, um, on the encoder side, it's attending to each uh, word in the input sentence with all of the others. It's also using multi-headed attention. So for example, uh, depending on the size, you could use different numbers here, but you know, by default, the transformer model uses eight attention heads. Um, each of these heads is learned independently. Um, uh, or Well, it's learned jointly, but they, they each attend independently. It's using a uh, normalized dot product attention. Um, uh, like I talked about before, um, uh, normalization removes the bias towards like larger or smaller things. Um, actually, I think this is a little bit of a misnomer and maybe I should correct this on the slides too. It's actually using something um, that's not exactly the same as uh, dot product attention. It's using um, the hidden state of the decoder and the hidden states of the encoder Um, multiplied by a uh, query matrix and a key matrix. And then it's taking the dot product of these two. So it's actually maybe more like a bilinear model than dot product uh, attention. So um, I wrote normalized dot product attention because they put it in the, in the paper, but actually I think bilinear is probably more, uh, more appropriate here. Um, uh, also, positional encodings. Um, this is something that I haven't covered yet. Um, and this is necessary because we're not using an RNN. And basically what the uh, positional encodings are, are they're something that we add to the input and output embeddings before we, um, 
before we run attention over them. And the positional encodings could just be learned vectors. They could be, um, uh, in the case of the transformer, they, uh, they compare learned vectors and um, some strange sinusoidal vectors that have a, like, uh, have an intuitive interpretation, but it's not super intuitive, so I'll just kind of skip over it now. But like the basic idea is that the input um, to the model is the word embedding and the positional embedding, um, where the positional embedding for position one is always the same, regardless of the ID of the word. So you have a, an embedding based on the word ID for position one, and then just um, an embedding uh, an embedding for position one itself. And that way, if we have multiple um, uh, multiple words in the sentence uh, that have the same word ID, you can actually distinguish between them. So like the at position, the cat and the dog, uh, the the at position number one would be, um, would end up with a different embedding from the the at position number four because uh, it would be the word embedding for the plus the positional embedding for one and the word embedding for the and the positional embedding for four. So um, this is important if you don't have anything like an RNN because like I said, you know, transformer models uh, or self-attentional models would not have the con concept of position otherwise. Um, also for, uh, this paper was very effective and influential and it obviously took a lot of work. Um, one unfortunate, slightly unfortunate thing about it is, in addition to introducing a whole bunch of modeling tricks, they also introduce a whole bunch of training tricks. Um, and it's a little bit difficult to disentangle the two. Um, but um, one important thing that they do is they do uh, layer normalization uh, over every output that they generate. Um, they have a specialized training uh, schedule where they basically um, adjust the training schedule of the atom optimizer to like have a slow start and then gradually do learning rate decay. Um, they also use something called label smoothing, which introduces some uncertainty in the training process. Um, and they have masking for efficient training. And actually, I realized I forgot one other thing. They also add residual connections between the layers. So to go back here, just to cover all of those at once, um, so we take the input embeddings, we add positional encodings to them. We have multi-headed self-attention, um, and then we add the um, we add the uh, the previous inputs, and we do uh, layer normalization. Um, and layer normalization basically uh, normalizes the layer to uh, uh, zero mean and unit variance, or uh, something uh, similar to that. Then we run this through a feed-forward network, a large feed-forward network with a large hidden state. And then we, again, add a residual connection and do layer normalization here. Then we repeat this kind of block over and over again. So if you're using the PyTorch neural net dot transformer, it's basically this whole gray block here, uh, essentially. Um, so, uh, so yeah. Um, but basically, like, um, I kind of wanted to break down each individual part here um, so that you could understand kind of what's going on inside. Um, and uh, there's a lot of stuff there. Yeah. Is the layer normalization the same as batch normalization? Layer normalization is, is similar to batch normalization, but batch normalization is over each um, element across the batch. Layer normalization is for each element across the layer. So basically, like, if you think about it, like, let's say um, these are uh, hidden, these are hidden states uh, from an RNN or something like that. And then you also have a batch. Um, the batch is, um, is normalizing across this dimension. The layer normalization is normalizing across this dimension. And one of the advantages of uh, layer normalization over batch normalization, like we talked about before, this batch normalization is very um, dependent on the batch size. It's different at training time and test time. Uh, if you're only processing one thing at test time, uh, layer normalization has none of those problems because it's always normalized over the layer. Um, yeah. Like, might be a weird question, but like, if they're uh, using residual connections, 
Like how do we know it's really effective? What is the main thing that is effective? So if they're using residual connections, how do we know it's effective? Um, well, it works. <laughs> um, uh, but like, uh, how, how do we know what effect it is? Um, uh, like each layer, for example, is actually causing on the outputs. Yeah, so probably like remove the self-attention. So what happens if you remove the, the self-attention or something like this? And I, I think um, this is a very good question. We're going to go into this a little bit about um, in like the model interpretation uh, section wh where we talk about how to like understand what's going on in these models. Um, Yeah, I don't, I don't know. It, it's it's kind of a very broad scoping, vague question. So maybe I'll talk about individual uh, like answers to that question in the model interpretation thing. Um, but long long story short, there there have been some examples uh, of works where that can say you can remove uh, like layers, full layers of the self attention. And I think the reason why you could remove full layers of the self attention is because it has a residual connection and maybe most of the information is being passed through the residual connection. There's also been some work, including some of our work, that shows that you can actually remove many of the self-attention heads and it doesn't hurt accuracy very much at all. Um, so maybe some of the self-attention heads aren't actually doing much more than just copying the information from the input to the output. So, um, yeah, good, good question, sir. Yeah. So uh, transformers are in energy using uh, attention models, which are ultimately using bidirectional RNNs, right? And RNNs sort of encode the entire history of a sentence, like, so that, then why do we at all need positional embeddings? Because the history is already there, right? If the position information is sort of encoded in the bidirectional history of RNNs, right? So um, the question was, like, do we need positional encodings for RNNs? And we don't. So RNNs can count like how many positions you've been from the previous one by just updating yeah. the state that many times? So attention models are based on that, right? Bidirectional. Um, oh, okay. So um, the transformer model has no RNNs in, involved in it whatsoever. So we actually, sorry, this, this, if this wasn't clear, I apologize. There's no RNN anywhere in this model, and that's hence the name attention is all you need. So this is, uh, this is a model that basically gets rid of all the RNNs and only uses attention. Um, and actually, I have one, one example uh, later here that kind of um, uh, illustrates why, why this is possible. And basically, when you actually do prediction, um, the way you do it is by attending to all of the words in the input and all of the words that you previously generated. So it's kind of like an RNN in that way, in that you can reference um, all of the previous words here. Um, it's still a left to right autoregressive model, so it's still referencing all of the things that you've generated so far. Um, so what you do when you predict the first word is you basically mask out all of the, um, you mask out all of the words in the output and you just use all of the words in the input. When you predict the second word, you mask out all but the first word in the output and do attention over all of the words in the input and the first word in the output. And then you can do this by stepping through until you get to the end of the sentence symbol. Um, so it kind of looks like an RNN in this way, except the way it's passing information is not by encoding it within a single vector that you pass on one at a time, but rather allowing attention to all of the previous words that you've seen before. Because the reason I asked was like in the reading, while reading attention, mm -hmm. like in the first pair it says like we are combining two RNNs, right? Bidirectional RNNs. Yeah, so this was the more like traditional uh, attentional model that was uh, proposed in the first thing in the first paper on attention, but this is a, um, a way that doesn't require any arguments. Yeah. Any other questions? These are good questions. Yes? Uh, how is self-attention implemented? How is self-attention implemented? Yeah. Um, so basically, um, your query vectors <coughs> and your key vectors are, um, are what you need for attention, right? So the in the previous example I showed, the query vector was from the decoder. The key vectors were from the encoder. Um, in this case, the query vector is from one position in the encoder, and the key vectors are also from the encoder. So your query vector just is the same thing as your, or corresponds to the same underlying inputs as your uh, key vector. The way you actually might implement it is, um, uh, is, uh, 
is you have a, a big matrix like this. Um, and the ma matrix is like the stacked, uh, you know, hidden states from the input. And the reason why you would want to do this is computational efficiency. Basically, this would allow you to very quickly calculate for all of the, um, all of the inputs. Yeah. And there should be good examples online of uh, efficient uh, implementations for this. Okay, so that's all I have for today. Um, any questions? Yeah. Is there a reading for transformers as well? Is there a reading for transformers? I think there's one on the references, but if there's not, I'll put it on Piazza. Okay, thanks.